You know, when uh, you're really familiar with something, you kind of lose the excitement for it. So like, if you see something all the time or you hear something all the time, you're constantly around something, you're so familiar and like you see it all the time, it's like, yeah, kind of loses excitement a little bit. Well, I want to remind all of you that where you live is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Like, I don't know if you kind of get bored or tired of looking at the ocean right behind me, but like that blue is unbelievable. But like believable because it's it's there. It's like, well, how does that exist? But anyway, I love where you guys live and it's a joy to be here this morning. If you're vacationing here, you picked a good place to vacation. It's gorgeous. There's a reason you chose here. Um, but like Mark said, my name is uh, Chris Kish. I am from Cleveland, Ohio, um, which isn't that exciting. We get a lot of snow. I don't know how many of you have. Uh, has anyone never seen snow in this room? All right. Wow. All right. Okay. Well, just picture the white sandy beaches, but like 90 degrees colder. And then you have to shovel it off your driveway. That's, that's what snow is. But that's where I'm from. Uh, grew, uh, born and raised in Ohio. Uh, went to Bible college. Graduated, moved to California, helped start a church out there, and then moved to Florida to help family church with their mission of starting more neighborhood churches all across South Florida. Uh, but when I think to my growing up years and to my family, my, my parents are believers, my sister's a believer, I grew up in a Christian home and very blessed for that. But there's some core memories that I have just ingrained in my mind that I recall when I was younger. So in order to get to my bedroom, you have to pass my parents' room. And I would pass by their room every evening after dinner and after, after our family devotions. I'd go to my room to do a puzzle or play or something. Actually, I never did puzzles. I drew or something else. I hate puzzles. But I, I went to my room to do something that evening and every evening I would walk by my parents door and I would see my dad with his back leaned up against the bed his glasses in his hand and his head leaning on his hand and he was praying every single evening I saw that and that image is burned into my mind because my dad and my mom instilled into me and my sister the importance of prayer and they taught us to go to God for everything. Like my dad just modeled that so well. And kids pay attention to what fathers do and what mothers do. And because I saw my parents continually praying and because I have that image of my dad burned in my mind of every single night after dinner and family devotions, he would go in his room for half an hour or 45 minutes and I would just see him praying. And I knew what he was praying about, at least in part. One of the things that I knew he was praying for was his father's salvation. So my dad got saved when he was 16 years old. He was reading a Billy Graham track. And he went into a closet and he prayed the prayer in the back of that track. And he said, God, I believe this. And he put his faith in Jesus. The only other Christian in his home was his mother, and my dad also wanted to put his faith in the Lord. So he did that afternoon in a closet in Elyria, Ohio, and he gave his life to Christ. After that, my grandpa started seeing changes and differences in his son. And my grandpa was a, a harder man, and he would make fun of my dad for going to church. And he made fun of him for being a Christian, and he gave him a hard time for his new faith. And my dad, loving his dad, continually prayed for his salvation. He prayed for him for probably close to 40 years, every single day. And when he married my mom, he told her about it. Or when he met my mom, he told her about it. And the two of them started praying together. When I was born and when my sister was born, they told us, hey, Grandpa needs Jesus. Please pray for him. So we had the whole family continually praying for my grandpa's salvation. 40 years is a long time to be faithful to pray for somebody. And I'm sure my dad got discouraged in his praying. God, are you really going to do this? How long do I need to pray for this thing 
before you answer the way I would like you to. I see some heads nodding this morning. We all can relate to this, right? Where we're praying for something in our own life or in the life of someone else and we're asking the question, God, how much longer? When are you going to do what I'm asking you to do? And we can get discouraged and lose heart. But what we're going to look at this morning in the Word of God is the example of Jesus and how he taught how we can have faith when we pray and when we ask him for something that's difficult or maybe not difficult. We just are praying and we'd like an answer. Whatever the case may be, there's an answer to it in the Word of God, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. So there's different doubt questions that we have, especially where we live now in society. God, when are you going to fix what's going on in the world? Everything's a mess. Have you turned your back on the world? Everything is crazy. God, when are you going to fix this? Or you may be saying or asking or praying, God, when will you restore the community? Will we ever build back from tragedy? Will I ever retire? Different questions that we go to God with and are expecting and wanting an answer. Listening to the requests that you all gave this morning, there's some heavy stuff going on in your life. You know people that are going through difficulty. Maybe you're going through difficulty yourself. And you just want to see God. I know I'm not the only one. Because we heard the prayer request this morning. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Is how to continue in faith. But there's some deeper questions that we probably have. Some deeper doubts. Some deeper prayer requests that we continually ask God for that maybe no one else knows about. When we say, God, am I truly free from sin? Because I've been struggling with the same temptation for years now. When will you free me from this? I'm asking you and asking you and nothing's happening. Are you there? Are you listening? We ask, when will you save that person that needs to be saved? Or when will you free me from my anxiety? or my depression, or my worry, or my loneliness, or my doubt. Please help me with this. Right? I cannot be the only one that's continually going to God with this stuff. We're all in the same boat. Whether we're praying about it or not, we all have hurts in our life. We need to go to the one who can answer those prayers. So before we open the Word of God, I want to pray. And dedicate this time to the Lord as we open his word. Father, thank you so much, Jesus, for your example of going to the Father in prayer. And I pray that this morning you would heal the broken places of our life. That you would restore to us the joy of being able to talk to you. That that wouldn't become familiar, but that every time we talk to you, we would be refreshed with the truth that you love us. And you are listening, even if you're not answering in the, the timely fashion we would like or in the way that we would like. Help us to be reminded of your love. God, bless your word this morning and this time that we have to be in it. Speak Holy Spirit to all of us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. I don't know if uh, y'all are note takers or not, but if you are, the uh, title for the message today is Help My Unbelief. Help My Unbelief. If you're a mental note taker, just mentally take the notes. But the title is Help My Unbelief. And I typically don't like to preach in points. I, I have a couple, but if you forget them, that's okay. What I want you to remember are two uh, statements. One is prayer expels doubt. Prayer expels doubt. So we, second phrase, pray often, pray hard. 
Prayer expels doubt, so we pray often, pray hard. Two different quotes, I just lumped them together, but the pray often, pray hard quote came right from my dad. He said that for years, and he still does. He tells our family, pray often and pray hard. Continually pray and pray hard for the different things that are going on in your life. So the title, Help My Unbelief, Prayer Expels Doubt, So We Pray Often and We Pray Hard. So let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14, reading through verse 29. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you. So you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. And then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into violent convulsions, and he fell to the ground, whirling and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Verse 23. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as the people asked, he or said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with the disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? Verse 29, Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out. By prayer. So, a little context to Mark chapter 9. This follows the event of the Mount of Transfiguration. So, Jesus was just on top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and they saw him in his glory. And Jesus is hanging out with Moses and Elijah. And, like, man, what an incredible experience! Like, everyone was at an all time high, literally and metaphorically, like they were up on a mountain. Um, But then Jesus comes down the mountain, and he's greeted by a very intense situation going on. So everyone's feeling great. They come down, and boom, there's a whole crowd of people that are in desperation, especially one father, and everyone is just watching what's going on. So three observations we're going to look at this morning from this text when it comes to doubt and prayer. Observation number one is there was desperation. There was desperation. All you have to do is look at the father. He said, Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? The father replied, since he was a little boy. We don't know how old the son was, but I'm guessing it was long enough that the father had to go to Jesus at this point. Because he was desperate. He tried maybe to fix it on his own. He couldn't do it. He went to Jesus' disciples, they couldn't do it. So then he goes to Jesus and he says, please help. I'm desperate. Like this evil spirit is throwing my son into fire and water trying to kill him. Jesus, please heal him. 
We like to be able to do things in our own strength. Men like to be the hero and do everything that we can in our power to fix the situation, especially when your wife is talking and the husband just always wants to step in and be like, I got this, let me give you the right answer. And sometimes you don't need to do that, but husbands and men, we like to be the hero and fix situations. And women love to be nurturing and care and try to help the situation that's going on in a very loving way. And we want to be able to fix things on our own. But sometimes there are things going on in our life that we just can't do and accomplish in our own strength. And that's good. Because we know the one who can. So we go to him. And sometimes it takes us to reach a place of desperation where we've been praying for something for so long or we've been hoping something so long that there's nothing else we can do except go to the Father. Get on our knees and pray and say, please help. And that's what my dad did for 40 years. And that's maybe what some of you are doing, where you're continually in a desperation state. We need to be able to go to the one who can expel and cast out the desperation by answering it with truth. And sometimes he's going to continually make us wait. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. But if God isn't answering your prayer the way you want to or in the time that you want him to, that does not mean he forgot about you. He loves you, but there's something else going on in the background that we can't see. So I want you to ask yourself this question. You can write this down. Answer it throughout the week. Answer it in your own mind. Discuss it with someone. What are you currently feeling desperate in that Jesus can relate to? Because Hebrews 4.12 says we have a high priest, Jesus, who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses and who has been tempted in every, we are, in every way we are, yet without sin. So God the Son can relate to us in everything that we're going through. So what are you currently feeling desperate in that God the Son can relate to you? And then talk about that with someone. Pray about that with someone. It's going to be a really important thought to think through. We go to the one who can alleviate the desperation and uh, point us to truth. So that's observation number one. There was desperation. Observation number two is there was doubt. There was doubt. And we see that doubt in verses 22 and 24. The Spirit throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us. What does the Father say there? Those three words. If you can. There's a little bit of doubt in that question. Please do it if you can. Jesus says, what do you mean if I can? Of course I can. Look who you're talking to. And then we see it again in verse 24. The Father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And there's things in all of our lives where we believe, we know God to be true. We put our faith in Him. Maybe you haven't yet put your faith in Him and that's where you need to start. But for those of us who have, maybe you've been walking with Jesus a long time and you do believe, but you've been praying a long time and nothing is happening. So you say, help me overcome the parts of me that don't believe in you and your answering of this prayer the way I would like you to. So there was doubt. That comes across sometimes with the questions of why haven't you done anything yet? Or where are you, God? I want to see you move. When I moved to California... Uh, it was March of 2017, and I moved out there to help start the church and do surfing ministry with an organization called Christian Surfers. My hair used to be like on my shoulders, super blonde, as surfer as you can get. I still like to surf, but I'm losing my hair, so I can't grow it out too long now. Uh, it just looks weird and scraggly. Um, but I moved out there for surf ministry and started a church. That was March. In the month of June, 
I was playing basketball because I was trying to meet as many people as I could in different ways, uh, surfing, athletics, whatever, just to meet people to invite them to our church and to the Christian surfing groups. And I tore my ACL playing basketball. That's a big bummer. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, torn your ACL or messed up your knee, but like that's a that's a long time you're out of commission. And I was super discouraged because I'm like, God, I moved to San Diego to do like active ministry. Like I, I, I like moving. I don't like just sitting down. Like how am I going to do all this if I can't even walk? I go to the doctor. He looks at the MRI or x-ray and he's like, yeah, you blew out your ACL. It's gone. You probably need some surgery. I was like, oh man. So I was praying. I said, God, please, please, please heal my knee. I spent a couple weeks praying, and I recall, I remember, I was taking a shower, and God gave me this thought to pray for, and I started laughing a little bit. I'm like, I can't pray for that. That's weird. But the thought was, God, not only will you heal my knee, but can you change? It feels weird to even say that. It's just a funny request, but... God, can you change the MRI result on paper so that when the doctor looks at it, he sees like everything's intact and everything's actually fine. So I I wasn't going to pray because it just seemed too crazy, but God kept telling me to pray for it. So I just felt very led to do that. So I did. I said, amen, kind of laughed a little bit more. I knew he could do it. But I, I doubted if he would. I was like, why, why, why would he? You know. But I knew he could. For God, he created the whole earth. He created everything. Like changing an MRI result and healing a knee is easy, right? Anything's easy for God. A couple minutes later, my phone rings. So I try to draw off my hand, and I, I lean out of the shower. Hello. So the doctor, he says, Hey, Chris, I was, I was curious. I went back and looked at your MRI again. And uh, I guess I read it wrong, but like your ACL is fine, and I just see a very slight meniscus tear. <laughs> Within like another week, I was walking normal. So I know God can do things. I have faith, which leads to the second story. A couple of years later, I uh, I broke my ankle in three places. I was doing downhill skateboarding, going pretty fast messed up on a a move that I always do, flew off my board, my ankle fell underneath my my leg and I fell on top of it and just snapped my ankle, my, my talus bone in three places. And I prayed again, God, please heal. I know you can. I've seen you do it. Can you do it again? And I had people pray for me and they, they laid their hands on, on my foot and they were praying over, over me. And I remember this one prayer morning that at my friend's house, people prayed over me and they said, all right, Chris, get up and walk. And I'm like, well, this is pretty swollen and it kind of hurts. But I, I tried and like, I, I just couldn't walk. So I, I sat down and they're like, I don't think you have enough faith. <laughs> this happened a couple times where people prayed over me and they were like, God, heal his ankle. And I was praying, but I just wasn't walking. And people came back and said, I just don't think you have enough faith. I'm like, you can't say that because I've seen God work and I know he can. But that doesn't mean he always will answer in the way I want him to. I wanted him to heal my ankle. I was out for like four months. That's a lot of work to miss. And it it did not speed up the process. I went through the whole thing. I still sometimes feel some pain in it. But the point of that story is sometimes God is doing something in the background that we can't see. We have this doubt in our life and we say, God, please do something. Or we don't have doubt and we say, God, I know you can. And if he's not doing it, that's okay because God is doing something else that we can't see. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't turned his eyes to you or his ears. He hasn't turned them off. God is big. And he sees all of the things going on 
and sometimes making us wait or saying no to certain things is accomplishing something greater that us, we just, we can't see. And that's okay. So that was uh, observation number two is there was doubt. Last one, number three. There was dedication. There was dedication. And we see that in verse 29. Starting in verse 28, when Jesus is with the disciples in the house, they say, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. So there was dedication. What's the dedication? There is dedication to pray. All of us this morning have an opportunity through the Holy Spirit at work within us to become better prayers, to become dedicated in our prayer. The disciples were trying to do something good. They wanted to cast out an evil spirit. Like their motives were probably right, but they were trying to operate out of a power that they did not have yet. Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon everyone, hadn't happened yet. So they were not filled with the Holy Spirit like they were in the book of Acts. So they were trying to operate out of a power that they didn't have. And Jesus is saying, you can't do it on your own. You need me. He said it in John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So abide in me. So what he's saying here is you need to pray. In some versions, some versions, maybe yours even says prayer and fasting. This kind can only come out through praying and fasting, which is even more dedication to pray. More dedication involved with giving up food or something. Like, I love food. It's hard to give that up. But there's times where it's like, God, I, I really would love an answer. So I'm even willing to give up food right now and replace those meal times with just praying. And that is dedication to pray. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap, you will reap, if you do not give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Easy to say, hard to do in the moment, when you feel defeated. But don't grow weary in doing good, don't grow weary in praying. Continue to stay faithful. It's not our job to ask God, will you do this? It's just our job to stay faithful and pray. We remind ourselves that anything we're asking for, God can do it. That is the faith. We know he can. And it's not our job to say, but will you? When will you? How will you? It's just to stay faithful, get on our knees and pray. My dad did that for 40 years with his father, and he got discouraged. My grandpa got pretty sick, was uh, admitted to the hospital. Um, this was a few years ago. And uh, after a couple weeks in the hospital, uh, he was uh, moved over to a nursing home. And my dad would visit him all the time. And he would keep reading scripture to him. He would keep sharing the gospel with him. And I remember my dad, my dad told me this story, but he asked his dad when he was getting closer to death, he said, Dad, are you sure you don't want to put your faith in Jesus, confess your sins, be made new? My grandpa leans over weakly to my dad, to his son, and he says, yeah, if you have time. My dad said, yeah, yeah, dad, I have time. And after 40 years of continually being on his knees and leaning his back up against his bed, praying in desperation that his dad would know Jesus, he saw the fruit of everything that he had been sowing and praying for years. Sometimes it takes a really long time for God to answer. In our mind, it's a long time. For God, he's always right on time. Cliche statement, but it's true. We have a different understanding of time and a different understanding of what we want and how we want it. 
But we continue to trust God, not growing weary and praying, knowing that we are talking to the only one, the one who can do it. So we stay faithful to do it. So I want you to ask yourself these questions as we close. What are you currently struggling to believe? What are you currently struggling to believe? I, I encourage you to share that with each other. I don't know all of you. I don't know any of you, really. Got here a couple days ago. But you guys know each other. You know the different things going on in each other's lives. Share them and pray together. A community is only as strong as its depthness of vulnerability. A community is only as strong as its depthness of vulnerability. So be vulnerable with each other. Talk about some deep things going on in your life. There's more going on than health things, which are really important, and God cares about them. But there's spiritual things going on in our life that God also cares about. We see that in all of Jesus' miracles where he heals someone, and then he says to that person, now go and sin no more. Jesus was concerned about two different things, the health of people, but more importantly, their eternal soul and their connection with the Father. So talk about the different things going on. What are you currently struggling to believe? And then imagine if this church, together, if all of us, if all of you really believed in the power of prayer. Or you were reminded, maybe you do believe and your belief is very strong, but you were reminded of the power of prayer. So all the requests given this morning, like God can heal all of those and maybe he already did. He can. So we pray knowing he can and we leave the results up to him. Last, last thing I'll say, maybe this morning for you, the first step is taking that step of faith and truly putting your faith in Jesus. Like I said, I don't know anyone in this room. I don't know where you're at with your walk with the Lord, but praying to God the Father starts with a relationship where you can put your faith in what Jesus did at the cross, dying for your sin and shame and guilt and brokenness so that you could be made whole, knowing that he came back to life and you have newness of life as well. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives within you and you pray from that power. That's the power you pray with. That's the power that can save you now and forever. Prayer expels doubt. So we pray often and we pray hard. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, the opportunity that we have to be in your presence, in your throne room. You invite us in, it says in the book of Hebrews, to boldly come before you. So God, I pray that in a humble way we would come before you and present our request to you, knowing that you can do it. Help us to believe in your power at work within us every time we go to you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us more. Thank you for the gospel. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. You see why I like